Good afternoon, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Azania. Good to be back with you. Yes, I was away. You were traveling. But here we are. Let's get into uh, that rhythm that we had just started establishing. So what is making headlines as far uh, as the science world is concerned? Well, I had a really interesting visit to Australia last week where I sat down Mm -hmm. with a guy called Sam Abraham, who's at the university or Murdoch University, which is in Perth. And he published a, a very interesting study at the end of the previous month where he'd actually gone around the country scooping up seagull poop. And you might say, why on earth would anyone want to do that? But what they were doing was extracting the bacteria from the seagull poo and asking, well, what sorts of microbes are in seagull poo and what sorts of antibiotics are they resistant to? Because we're all very worried about the prospect of finding resistant antibiotics cropping up increasingly in human infections because we're running out of drugs to treat these bugs with. The really worrying finding was that the seagulls he studied all over the Australian continent, and bear in mind they haven't just, seagulls don't just live in Australia, of course, they live everywhere, but they've only looked in Australia, which means this problem they're highlighting Mm. could very well be extremely widespread. They found highly resistant bacteria living in these seagulls, and these are not just seagull bacteria, these are forms of these microbes that they can prove genetically were originally human infections and are highly resistant oh. in, to, to drugs including ciprofloxacin, for example, which are right. used to treat a wide range of disorders. So what this is saying is that we have established in a bird population a reservoir of highly antibiotic-resistant types of bacteria, including things like E. coli. And where they mm-hmm. probably get this from is rubbish dumps and sewage outflows because we're not very good at doing good stewardship on what we release into the environment. These birds are attracted to rubbish dumps and also sewage outfalls and things, and possibly also because filter-feeding animals go and uh, like the nutrient-rich water around sewage outlets, the animals that the birds then feed on may well be colonised with these microbes, meaning the birds then pick them up. And of course the worry is the birds can go anywhere. They don't need passports, but they sure as hell can fly. As though they can cross borders. (laughs) And if it's seagulls, that's one thing. But who knows? Many, many other birds may also be colonised with these things. So they're quite worried. I think it's a very interesting canary in the coal mine to take another kind of bird analogy of what might be happening in terms Mm. of the spread of this sorts of drug resistance around the world. Very interesting indeed. Let's go next to uh, Jerry, who's given us a call. Uh, so we've got our time every single Monday, just after 2.30, by the way, on the show with The Naked Scientist. Good afternoon, Jerry. Thank you for the call. Hi. Hi. Uh, I just want to ask, Chris, uh, why is it that uh, men are bald evenly? So there's, uh, there's a circle on your head. I mean, why wouldn't we bald from the bottom up type of thing? Is there a particular <laughs> reason for that? Hello, Jerry. The answer to this is it's called male pattern baldness and the P pattern Mm -hmm. actually harks back to the point you're making which is that the hair loss follows a stereotyped pattern generally in men. This trait is a male trait it's actually on the X chromosome and because women have two copies of the X chromosome and less testosterone they're more Mm -hmm. uh, or they're less likely to be prone to it than men are. But this is a genetic trait. You'll see certainly some men in the population never lose their hair. They just go maybe a bit grey or their hair thins very slightly, whilst other men can go very, very bald, very, very young. And this trait actually is because on the X chromosome is a receptor or a, a gene which is involved in decoding the testosterone signal in men. And hair follicles Mm -hmm. convert testosterone into a different form of testosterone, which is toxic to them. And this occurs with selective vulnerability across the top of your head. Because on other parts of your body, exposure to testosterone makes you more hairy. On the top of your head, Mm. it makes you less hairy because it kills off the hair follicles that produce the hair, but it does it in that characteristic patterned way. We don't know exactly why there's that selective vulnerability, but it's because your head and your face is symmetrical. You get get the same symmetry (laughs) in the... Uh, sensitivity to testosterone across the top of the head. So this is why if you unfortunately have a bald family members, you're probably at higher risk of going bald yourself. If you have men in your uh, family tree who don't tend to lose their hair, there's a very high likelihood you're going to keep your hair too. Right. So, Jerry, what what made you think of that? What were you observing? No, I just was very interested to find out why, why? Uh, you know, why it was in a specific pattern. Yes. As opposed to, you know, one side versus the other side. It's mm. exactly around, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, great question. Thank you so much. That's Jerry in Valterfreden Park. We're taking more of your calls on 11 for the Naked Scientist. Uh, some of you have opted to WhatsApp, and uh, this one says, please ask the Naked Scientist whether it's true that we share 50% of our DNA with bananas. Yeah, this is an old chestnut to take a different kind of plant analogy. But the answer is, yes, we do. But you have <laughs> to understand... Yeah, I'm doing well today. You have to... Un- actually, I understand. Um, I dropped a real good one last week because there was someone who I was talking to who works in the meat business and he was he was actually making some yeah. investment in a project and I said, well, what's the size of his stake? Ba-boom. But anyway, <laughs> the other people in the room just didn't get it until later on someone started to laugh and then they said, I can't believe how lame that joke was. But there we are. Yeah. It, it was pretty lame. But um, in, in order to explain the banana analogy, in cells there is DNA. That DNA is carved up into chromosomes, which are effectively chapters in a recipe book, and those, those chromosomes have on them thousands or up to several thousand genes. The genes are individual recipes for things that your cells do. Now, those genes include genes that make the cell metabolically active. They give it the ability to grow, they give it the ability to make energy, they give it the ability to make proteins, etc. Now, those Mm. genes are going to be the same sort of gene in a banana as they are in a human. They're going to be doing a similar sort of job, but that doesn't mean it's an identical Um. gene. There may be some similarity, but the gene which, for instance, breaks down sugars and releases energy from them is going to be doing an analogous job in my cells. And effectively, I can find a gene mm-hmm. that's very, very similar in me. It's not the same gene. It's it's a gene doing the same job, which is in some cases in a similar position in relation to other genes, but it's not the same gene. Mm-hmm. So the actual wording that, that the gene spells out may be subtly different, and it will be different between different organisms. If I compare some of the genes that make my body work with the genes in your body, for example, we've got analogous genes in similar places on our chromosomes chromosomes but they're spelled a bit differently they work a bit differently and that's why there's all this difference between each person because we're all genetically unique bananas they're living things they're living cells that have many processes very similar to our own therefore they have many of the same genes doing similar jobs that we do but the spelling of those genes and the subtlety and how those genes work will be different so yes you actually share probably more than 50 percent of your genes with a banana but actually if you look at the spelling of the genes there will be quite a lot of differences Yes, yes. And I guess that's what, um, you know, since researchers have been able to uh, write the, the, the human gene or the, be able to create the genome, we know a whole lot more about what we share with other species around the world. Yes, hit the nail on the head. This is how we've begun actually to enrich our understanding of where life came from on Earth and how all these different taxonomies or organisations of species, how they're all related. So you can begin to see really mm. interesting parallels. For instance, not many people realise that the closest relative of a whale is a hippo. And actually, when you think of it in those terms, oh, yes, I can see why that may be. You've got two very aquatically dominated species. Um, Yes, I can see that, you know, one does spend more time in the water than the other. But yes, you can then begin to understand how one may have evolved into the other. We know this because we've read the genetic code of a hippo. We've read the genetic code of a whale. And you can see that there are various viruses which, way back in history, inserted themselves into various points in the genomes of those animals. And you can see that they share a common ancestor millions of years ago before the two split apart to make whales and hippos. I didn't expect that. You know, when you said the whale, I definitely thought, yes, maybe another mammal didn't expect a hippo at all. That's so fascinating. And then, of course, we know how close we are to the chimpanzees and the bonobos, uh, uh, which on its, which should remind us that... Uh, Yes, we are a little bit special, but we're still animals at the end of the day. Well, there's another nice example of this, which is that there are these species called sea grasses. And they're very widespread. Mm. They're really important for the ecosystem because they soak up pollutants. They also store a lot of carbon. And they're very pretty, these sea grasses. They grow on the on the seafloor and they flower and they feed lots of things. But if you do their genome, yeah. you can actually see that these sea grasses evolved from land plants. And what happened is that 400 plus million years ago, things, life, came out of the oceans, invaded the land, that included the plants. And then at some point, these yes. sea grasses went from the land back into the ocean and we know this by looking at the structure of these plants but also genetically we can see they're almost the same as the grasses that grow on land. Let's go to Catherine. Catherine is calling us from Santon. Good afternoon Catherine. Hi there Adania. Welcome. Um, My question is, thank you, is is there a reason why um, birds oftentimes like to swoop in and fly 
um, in front of cars on the road, particularly in urban and city areas, but they don't do that in the rural areas. It's almost like they want to be hit by cars. <laughs> and it's usually the pigeons that have a little bit of pink to them. Have you noticed that? Um, yes, but I've seen it with all kinds of birds. Oh. Um, and they wait for you to approach before quickly flying away. Yes. But they don't do that so much in the, in the countryside or rural areas. It's so true, Catherine. And they also leave the road too late. So you often don't know, should I break because I'm going to hit this bird? And I'm sad to say I've actually hit a bird and I screamed so, I was devastated because the feathers were scattered all over my windscreen. But I just kept thinking, move, move. And it just didn't move. Chris, is there a reason? Well, we get this uh, in the UK quite a bit. And you often will see birds like pigeons sitting there loitering in the middle of the road for quite a while and Mm -hmm. they leave it till the last minute to leave. We think, because I've thought about this in the past, we think that one of the reasons that they're attracted to the road at the end of the day is because it tends to be warmer and they're getting a free metabolic boost from the road because it's nice and warm and birds are warm-blooded so they they thrive on a bit of extra heat. So we think part of the attraction of roads to some bird species is the warmth coming off the road. The other thing to consider, uh, Catherine's making a comparison between urban and rural situations. Now, it may well be that Mm. actually the birds are drawn to roads in cities because where there are roads, there may be more trees and plants growing alongside the roads and that means maybe more lunch, more insects and things to to grab more other tidbits. Some birds also like to eat the things that have been mown down by cars for instance you know squashed mammals and and other small animals that have been squished by things they're more likely to therefore be visible and accessible on the road so the bird might see it and think well i'll have that now what catherine doesn't necessarily know is what the bird was doing when she wasn't there to see it because there may be an element of observer bias here you tend to notice this when you're coming along in your car but you're not looking in your rear view mirror to see what the birds are doing behind you so it may actually be that they're doing this all the time they're drawn to the road by the temperature by the provision of food which can include squished animals and possibly more insects drawn by the plants and so she tends to notice it a bit more because she's looking forward and thinks they're doing this but they're just doing it all the time and it's only when she comes along that it's a problem for her yes Oh, so it's the warmer road. As simple as that. It's good to Andrew in Hamanskral. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Azania. Hi. Dr. Chris, um, I thought tuberculosis was only confined to the lungs, but recently a friend of mine was diagnosed with tuberculosis of the spine. How's that? Oh, hello, Andrew. Okay, well, so the, TB the, of the spine. The medical name for TB of the spine is POTS disease, P-O-T-T-S, POTS disease. And the thing with tuberculosis, I always used to say to the medical students I teach, and I still do say this, if you're stuck for a cause of a disease or a cause of a syndrome in, in say, an exam, always write down TB because TB can do anything because I, I cease to ever be surprised by TB because it's one of those infections that it, it seems to be able to access any bit of your body. It can cause disease in any bit of your body. The most common manifestation, of course, is that this is a respiratory infection. We spread it by coughing out droplets which are carrying infectious forms of TB and we breathe those in. Therefore, the initial site yes. of infection is the lung, but it doesn't stay in the lung. And the TB migrates from the lung to initially your lymph nodes that drain the lung. And from there, it can access all areas of the body. And in fact, in recent years, scientists have found, I think a study using samples from South Africa helped to prove this actually, that the TB makes its way to the bone marrow and hides in stem cells in the bone marrow. And even in someone who's considered cured of TB, you can still find viable bacteria Mm -hmm. hiding inside these stem cells in a switched off state. But basically, TB can come out of the lung and out of the lymph nodes that drain the lung and it then goes around the body it's very good at evading the immune system and it can get into any tissue that has a blood supply and bone is one place where you can trap tb microorganisms as they go through and they then begin to proliferate in the bone they cause intense inflammation and destruction of the tissue and this causes bone to to deform and often fuse. So if you've got a joint and it's infected with TB, you can get fusion of the joint because Mm -hmm. bone can grow between the two. And so you you end up with very destructive um, inflammation. And it can also get into the fluid around the brain and cause meningitis. And we're increasingly seeing cases of tuberculous meningitis as well. So just because TB causes people to cough, it doesn't mean it stays put in the lungs. It can go anywhere and do anything. So again, medical students listening, anyone doing medicine stuck for a diagnosis, never forget TB (laughs) because it's the one thing that's easy to overlook but can be can be managed, can be treated if you get the diagnosis right and you'll save people's lives. And it travels, as you said. Uh, let's squeeze this one in from Hanyani. Hello, Hanyani. Hi, Azania. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Go ahead. 
good, thank you. So I'm not too sure how to phrase this question, right? But basically, what I want to find out is, you see, when you're standing somewhere or rather sitting somewhere, if someone is looking at you from either angle, uh, it, it could be from the backwards or whatever, or, or on the side. If you turn your head around and look at that person, you find that they actually are looking at you. How do we tell? How do we how do you stand there? <laughs> So how do you know that when you you know that feeling you feel that someone's yes, eyes are yes. on you? Okay, uh, Chris. I think there's a range of things to consider here. One, again, we were talking to Catherine about this: the observer bias with the birds. There are a number of times when you probably turned around and no one was looking at you. And because they weren't looking at you, you dismissed it and forgot about it. So you tend to notice the time when you go, I was sure they were looking at me. I turn around and goodness, look at that. They were looking at me. And you remember the the positives and you dismiss the negatives. So you have to be cautious not to skew your argument by that. There are some other giveaways, though, which is that people tend to adopt a certain posture they may breathe differently. They may give away non-verbal or other cues that they're doing something. So if someone's staring at you, it may be because they either want to harm you, it may be because they fancy you and they want to come and ask you out on a date, but either way, their physiology is going to change and they, that may be reflected mm. in cues that you might not, you might not think you're realising you're picking up on, but you do. And this has come from... Mm -hmm. thousands to millions of years of evolution we've become very good at tuning into our environment especially our social environment because humans live and die by the people we hang around with we're a very social species Mm -hmm. and we're so successful because of the help of other people so if you're tuned into how other people are thinking feeling and reacting towards you by picking up on these subtle other cues like breathing rate like the noises or the subtle movements they might be making it does give you those giveaways that perhaps they're looking at you but you know be very careful about the observer bias at the same time Right, not to read too much into that. Chris, as always, thank you very, very much. Next Monday is a date, right? I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.